Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Steve Double. I'm the Member of Parliament for St Austell and Newquay in Cornwall, and I also chair the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Ocean Conservation. Uh, this event this morning is a joint uh, event between two of the uh, leading environmental cross-party working groups in uh, Westminster, the uh, APPG for Ocean Conservation and also the APPG for Tidy Britain. Uh, there's no doubt that environmental issues uh, have never been higher up the both the public and the political agenda than they are right now. And we've seen just with the announcements from the Prime Minister this morning that we're in, continuing to, to uh, raise the profile of, of environmental issues. It's also sadly true that the COVID-19 pandemic has um, highlighted uh, many of the issues around plastic pollution and uh, regrettably it, it, it appears that much of the progress that we had been making may have been put on hold uh, during the pandemic this year. Uh, the government has already taken some very progressive steps to tackle plastic pollution including bans on microbeads, uh, bans on single-use plastic straws, cotton buds and, and stirrers, introducing the plastic bag charge, which has taken literally billions of plastic bags out of circulation, and is committed to establishing an all-in deposit return scheme. There, are, there, however, remains much work still to be done in reducing plastic waste and from it entering into our oceans. Today, we're here uh, to hear from uh, a panel of experts from across sectors, including the Secretary of State for the environment, George Eustace, uh, and uh, listen to what they have to say, what they believe are the true solutions to plastic pollution. We're also gonna be joined by a panel of younger keynote listeners who will be listening to what the experts have to say and will be asking questions around the action that they want to see today's leaders take. Alison, the Chief Executive of Keep Britain Tidy, will be chairing the first section when we'll be hearing from our expert panels, and then we'll be handing over to the youth panel for a few questions, and that section will be chaired by Hugo, who's the Chief Executive of Surface Against Sewage. At 9.30, I'm delighted to say we will be joined by the uh, Environment Secretary and my fellow Cornish MP, George Eustace, who will be offering his own insights into how uh, we can do more to tackle the plastic crisis. Our, uh, our keynote listeners will then have another chance to question our panel before we open up uh, to a short audience Q&A. We'll then be concluding and my friend uh, uh, Kevin Hollingreich, who's the chair of the APPG for uh, Tidy Britain, will be uh, concluding our session uh, just before 10 o'clock. A few housekeeping points. Uh, please post any questions that you have in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens and we'll try and answer as many of the questions as possible given the time restraints that we have uh, and we'll make sure that we follow up on any that we don't get to answer after the event. The event is being recorded and will be shared with those who haven't been able to join us uh, today. We'll also be running a poll that you'll uh, to find out what you think the true solutions are. Make sure, please, that you participate uh, in this poll. And uh, Kevin, at the end, will be announcing the results uh, of the poll. And also, please, let's uh, get this event out on social media, particularly on Twitter, using the hashtag, uh, hashtag true solutions to plastic pollution. So without further ado, I'll just say thank you again for joining us. So I hope we're going to have a, a really interesting hour together. And I'll now hand over to Alison, who's going to chair the next section of this event. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, and, and welcome, everybody. I first of all like to start by um, particularly thanking Steve, because it really was his vision in a conversation that we had um, not long ago although it seems like a very long time ago, um, to work together, um, Surface Against Sewage and Keep Britain Tidy. And I'm absolutely delighted that today's event is, is just such a joint endeavour. Um, I'm going particularly excited to welcome my fellow CEO, Hugo, who we're going to be hearing from later. Um, and I'd like to thank colleagues in both Surface Against Sewage and KBT, particularly at RN, Rupali and Rich, um, for making this happen. It's an exciting event, and I think we've all got some important contributions to make. 
it's my privilege to be able to introduce our, our, our expert speakers. Um, these are people who are global um, spokespeople for the movement against um, plastic pollution. This is without doubt a global problem. Um, plastic uh, pollution is something that has to be tackled on a global scale. But having said that, I think there's a real role in the UK for leadership and for us to be able to show if we are ambitious enough that we can bring in measures that are going to make significant difference. And I'm particularly um, excited to hear from the Secretary of State later because I know this government wants to set higher ecological standards in the environment bill that we currently enjoy. And what we all want to see within those standards is, is, is um, our measures that are going to not only make a big difference in the way in which we um, create and dispose of plastic in this country, but uh, plastic waste, but also um, show again, what can be done. Let's get clever and creative and, and be part of the solution, not the problem. So I, as, as, as everyone's mentioned, we've got four fantastic experts. My first expert is the amazing Lucy Siegel, who I think all of us have seen um, on, on the telly. She has actually been broadcasting and, um, and talking about and convincing the public to take action on plastics since 2007. So she's an early cry for change. Um, she is regularly seen on the one show. She's published on the subject. She's absolutely passionate and I'm delighted to be able to welcome her, Lucy. Thank you, Alison. Um, thank you, Steve. And thanks for inviting me just to the keynote panel, the youth panel. Don't worry if you haven't got a clue who I am and you don't watch the one show. I know that our audience is a little bit older, not to worry. Um, so as Alison says, I have been talking about this for about 100 years and I actually got really into um, plastics and the fact that they should be used carefully when I was really, really young because um, my granddad was a very early adopter of um, uh, taking his own uh, bags to the supermarket and stuff like that. And he always told me they're a very precious resource. Now, obviously, we have all had uh, a kind of giant awakening to plastics. And if you remember Blue Planet 2, SDA's, uh, Sir David Attenborough's intervention in 2017, it just seemed like this massive awakening. Well, it might surprise you to know that that, uh, which is a kind of global response to the plastic pollution crisis, even if we added all of those, all of the energy and efforts together, we still think that would only reduce plastic by 7% plastic going into the ocean. And that means because um, instead of a reduction, we're actually seeing an increase in plastic use and plastic volumes in lots of different areas that it is projected by 2040 that plastic pollution going into the ocean will have quadrupled, quadrupled. And that is obviously not where we want to be. So at the moment, it's as if we are um, really kind of trapped in what I call the linear economy. Well, I don't just call it that, that's what it is. So the linear economy is where we take, we extract resources, we make something and then we waste it. And we know that we discard products far too early. And the problem with that is that it is incredibly bad for the planet, but it's also bad for us as well, because we do not get uh, what we pay for because we don't get the use out of products uh, and we're discarding far too early. And the other problem with that is that um, you get lots of cheap products so I work a lot in fast fashion for example which is increasingly using plastic fibers uh, instead of natural fibers and the people or the the um, entity that picks up the real cost the true cost of that is the planet and uh, uh, people who are uh, in the developing world by and large um, we also experience uh, an impact from that because we see plastic pollution everywhere and we don't like it. So the antidote to the linear economy and the plastic pollution is the complete opposite, which is the circular economy. Now, the circular economy you might have heard of, it is where... Um, it is where materials are used continuously and the full value of the material needs to be claimed at every stage. And that means that we have to think about materials differently. We have to design products and services differently so that they hold their value and that they can be reclaimed. Now, at the moment, we are um, 
uh, talking about circular economy a lot, but we're often using a fake form of circular economy, uh, which is really semi-circular economy. So we see lots of brands and retailers pushing out products, plastic products onto the marketplace without any plan about how they're gonna collect and dispose of those products, never mind making them circular. So sometimes uh, products are collected, plastic products in particular are collected once, recycled once, but they go down the chain rather than holding their value. And that is semi-circularity. So in terms of solutions, we need to talk, think and act around a real circular economy. So one that is honest, upfront and doesn't get stuck in this place of semi-circularity. Um, there's lots of plans on how to do this, um, and it is really well set out in lots of different um, uh, programs, and we need to follow them, but we need to be uh, excited about it because the circular economy, the real circular economy, unlocks loads and loads of advantages, and those include uh, carbon reduction, decarbonisation, it's been proven as one of the fastest ways to decarbonise uh, products and services that we use, which is incredibly important because we need to get to those Paris goals. And it also allows us to do things like create the green jobs that we hear about. Um, so real circular economy is one of my big, big solutions. The other thing that we need to do is stop looking at plastics as the be all and end all. And we need to stop thinking about them as being really innovative materials. You know, plastics were invented in the 1860s. We can design better. Um, I also think that um, I would like to see the UK government signing up and uh, speaking really positively about uh, a global treaty to end plastic pollution, which is being uh, mooted at the moment. And the US and the UK government are still to um, uh, sign up to that. And um, the other thing that I wanted to say, the final thing that I'll, I'll say is that we're, we're always thinking in terms of more, more, more. Volume, plastic pollution is a volume problem at its very heart. And we think about sort of stuff like renewable energy. Well, let's just create more of it so we can carry on doing stuff as normal. We need to put earth logic first. We need to think about the planet in everything that we do. And it is not compatible to pump out more stuff and try and pick up the bill later. So language as i say is important instead of rhetoric about becoming the saudi arabia of wind why don't we come the become the bhutan of plastics and why don't we find alternative solutions and scale down our use of plastic because that for me would be really revolutionary thank you brilliant thank you so much lucy that that's that that's a, a very very strong start and a real um call to action i think as uh, sir, sir david attenborough said um you know we uh we all need to waste less. And I think the call for a global treaty is what's going to be required to make real action, to, to, to create real change in, in this endemic problem. So our, our next speaker is Michelle Norman. Um, Michelle is, uh, is the uh, Director of External Affairs and S Sustainability at Suntory Beverage. And if you haven't heard of Suntory Beverage, um, it, you will have heard of their iconic products, Ribena and Lucasade. Michelle has been the head of a number of initiatives to improve um, the uh, environmental impact of the products um, in the marketplace, um, some around reducing sugar. But specifically, um, our interest here is the work that she's done across the company, focusing on reducing plastic and waste across its value chain. So without further ado, Michelle, um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> yes, as Alison said, we're a soft drinks company famous for making Ribena and Lucozade, which have been around since the 1920s. And we sell those drinks in a number of ways. They come in bottles, both glass, plastic, they come in cans, they come in cartons. I'd also like to thank Hugo um, for giving me the opportunity to come along today. You know, I um, back before lockdown, I read um, Steppers Against Sewage annual litter report. And I saw that Lucasade was um, featured quite heavily as a discarded item on the beaches. And that saddened me. It made me so disappointed to see because you know, we put a lot of effort into making these brands, these products. And the last place we want to see them is discarded as waste and litter. So we got in touch and said, you know what, this is not something we're happy about. I want to tell you what we're trying to do about it, but also how can we work um, better together 
to find solutions. And so he invited me along today to tell you guys a few of the things that we're doing um, to try and make um, our, our plastic both more sustainable, but to not be a pollutant in countryside, natural environment and our oceans. So our company is focused on sustainable growth and we've made a number of commitments to limit our impact on the resources. They range from reducing our carbon emissions and we have science-based targets to do that within the decade, to reduce the water that we use and to invest in um, enhancing UK biodiversity, in particular with the 34 farmers that we work with for our Ribena farms and we do a lot of work in that area. When it comes to packaging, we've stated globally that we're going to move all of our plastic to be sustainable. And I'll come on to tell you what that means. We don't want to see our packaging discarded, littered or treated as waste. We're fully committed to the circular economy. And that is the real circular economy, as uh, Lucy just talked about. And we do set the measures set out by this government and more widely the EU single use plastic directive. But it's really important that the measures that have been set out by government, such as deposit return schemes, which is a brilliant, brilliant example of real circularity and the reform of extended producer responsibility are put in place sooner rather than later, because that will enable the circular economy to thrive. It'll provide the infrastructure that we need, that we so desperately need, actually, if we're going to see significant change. So what have we been doing as real action? Well, we've been designing for circularity. Um, Alison mentioned there's a number of measures that we've been doing and you know we came to realize um, you know probably that infrastructure wasn't doing the job that we needed it to do and actually we needed to fix our own packaging to enable full circularity so we're redesigning all of our packaging you'll know that the Ribena bottle has um, a full sleeve well actually it doesn't anymore so as of last week we fully redesigned all of our Ribena packaging for circularity that means removing all of the plastic from the outside and it this bottle now is fully optimized to go into the recycling system and come out the other side and can be made back into a bottle because did you know that even though 74 percent of plastic bottles are collected here in the uk less than 10 percent actually go on to be made into bottles and that's not good enough plastic is a resource it costs us money to make it so we need it back. We need it back so we can keep on using it again and again and again. It's a valuable resource. And that means we don't have to create any more if we can just reuse what we've already got. So we'll be um, moving to do exactly the same designs for LucasAid Sport, LucasAid Energy within the year. And as well as designing for circularity, of course, we're trying to remove and reduce packaging as much as possible. You know, we need something to put the, the drink in. So we look to minimize the packaging where we can um, and we make choices. We make choices whether something goes into a plastic bottle, a can, glass, but there's also some really exciting things and um, dispense and vending and real alternatives to packaging as well. We've been experimenting with um, algae based packaging, for example, which is edible for LucasAid Sport that you can use when you're running and you just pop them into your mouth and, and they just burst in your mouth and you can eat them. It's really innovative, it's different, it's probably a long-term solution, but there are solutions out there to help reduce all of the packaging that we use because uh, packaging is used quite excessively and there are ways to minimize. We do welcome the work of this committee and all the participants in working towards a world where there's no plastic pollution. There are long-term solutions out there, but also short-term solutions. And those short-term solutions are for companies such as ours to make the change that needs to happen, to inspire other companies to invest money. COVID hasn't stopped us investing and in bringing this new bottle to market. So it can be done. Uh, and we just encourage everyone to work together for the better and to listen to members of the public, to consumers, to groups such as yourselves, to see how we can make changes for the better. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michelle. That was really, really, really important. Um, it is going to be absolutely vital that we have the support of companies like Suntory because um, your, going, your measures um, and your initiatives are going to make all the difference to help stop all that um, packaging finding its way into the season. For those of us that um, um, regularly do litter picks, it, it is always debilitating. You always imagine, well, how does the, how does the uh, brand feel when it's brand pitches up in areas of natural beauty where it has no business being. So I'm really, really delighted to hear about your um, commitment to see plastic as a resource and really wanting to see change happen. 
Our, our next speaker is uh, Yunan Ismawati. Uh, Yunan is um, a, uh, an environmental engineer and an award-winning one at that. She works on city and rural water supply systems. Um, and in 2009, Yunan was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize um, specifically for her work as a co-founder of the Balafocus Foundation, which is a Bali-based environmental NGO specifically working on um, the issues of, of water resource and plastic pollution. Uh, I'm in de delighted to be able to welcome Yunan to our panel. Yunan. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and join this, this um, uh, panel. Um, I live in Buckinghamshire, um, but I still uh, help my organization based in Indonesia that now called Nexus for Health, Environment and Development, Nexus 3. Um, over two decades of my work in Indonesia, uh, I've seen different kind of problems of waste. And uh, most, most uh, shocking for me is the uh, poor urban communities. Um, the cities and big cities in Indonesia uh, do not have sewerage system, do not have proper waste collection system and, and uh, disposal. Um, but um, even worse for uh, urban poor communities, uh, they do not have a waste collection system. So most of their wastewater and solid waste ended up in the environment. So what we did is to develop a program and uh, pilot projects in 2001 until 2003, and then uh, empowered the communities as well as um, inviting governments to fund some of the infrastructures. And then later on, it's operated by the communities themselves. So that program now has been adopted as a nation, nation, national program and still up and running until now with uh, multi sources of financing. So from my experience, multi stakeholders work very well uh, to achieve and make changes. So coming to the next, uh, the next, the last uh, 10 years, uh, uh, we've seen more problems because um, uh, we have um, generated more waste than uh, than before. And I think the infrastructures could not catch up, the financing also could not catch up. And um, I would like to share my screen, if I may. Um, no, <laughs> I cannot share it. Okay, so um, in the last uh, five years, um, we have seen new problem because China closed the door for um, uh, importing waste uh, from all over the world. And as the result, since 2017, most waste um, redistributed to the neighboring countries, including to Indonesia, to my country, to my home country. And um, we've seen in the field the, uh, a different kind of, of waste, especially plastic waste and packaging uh, came from all over the world. And um, some of it, the second largest, the second highest in, that we received in Indonesia from the UK. Um, I'm, I'm sad because at home here in, in Amersham, I separated my waste just to find out and to learn that it might end it up in one of the communities in Indonesia. And then when I uh, learn more about the situation, it's not only um, the problem of Indonesia, but also many developing countries. And as the results last year, um, all countries um, um, uh, initiated or proposed by uh, Japan and Norway um, push for the, a global agreement uh, through uh, Basel uh, Convention because Basel Convention regulate uh, and control the transboundary movements of waste and toxic waste. And as the results last year, it was adopted by 180 countries that the new rules of, uh, of exporting and importing plastic waste will be changed. So as of the 1st of January, 2021, these new rules will be uh, entered into force. So I, I've seen the, the, the um, statistics or the trade flow of plastic waste from the UK um, declining already. Uh, but I'm not sure whether that number of 2019 is uh, already final or not final yet. It means that we're still uh, expecting to see some numbers, but uh, um, export from the UK. 
but uh, with the new bill and a lot of uh, programs and investment done by the UK government to improve the situations, uh, I hope that the circular economy and the circularity will also apply proximity approach, which means that it should be recycled in the UK most, um, most of the waste, not exporting it uh, outside of the UK. Um, uh, I've seen also the uh, chart from uh, Buckinghamshire Council that most of waste that we collected are uh, exported and um, recycled uh, by different groups. But when I've asked um, the council that I didn't see the plastic stream into in, in that chart, they said, oh, we recycle it overseas. So I hope that um, this kind of information also will be made available for public, that um, the public in the UK uh, uh, where, where they waste being recycled to. Um, and uh, lastly, I think we have to also um, uh, encourage ourselves to have a better practice in separating our waste uh, because with the new rules, it has to be exported in form of clean. It means that the bottles like Rebena, um, you have uh, already made a good step by reading off the, um, the plastic film and um, recycle the, the cap in the UK that will be helpful because the, the, the new rules will be exporting in form of clean, um, clean form of, of plastic waste. So uh, I welcome the work of this committee and um, I hope that we can um, encourage uh, the young generations to, uh, to look after themselves and also with our support, thank you. Thank you, Union. That was really um, fa fascinating. Um, I think we, we all want to see the next generation do better than we have. Um, I think that's a universal cry. Um, and I, I think it's really uh, important that um, you ask the question, where is this plastic going? Um, we need to make sure that the public has faith in the system. And if we can't answer the question, where is our recycling pl plastic going? Um, I don't think we're going to get the kind of take up into the system that we need. Uh, and it's, we're going to need that enthusiastic take up because people are going to have to get a lot busier about how they process their packaging in order to make sure it's suitable for recycling. All of these are milestones that we, we have to um, uh, achieve in order to be able to do a heck of a lot better than we are to date. Um, our final speaker is Professor Richard Thompson. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to, to welcome him to this discussion. He, he is a, a leading marine biologist. He is the director of the Marine Institute at the University of Plymouth. But most importantly for the purposes of this debate and for us all really is he is the um, leading, um, fun, fundamentally leading expert on um, marine plastics and I suppose he has many, many claims to fame, but one of them is coining the term microplastics in 2004 and really bringing an awful lot of the data and research to us that have enabled those of us that campaign on the issues to be able to make a stand and hopefully um, in, in, in due course make a difference. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to uh, welcome Professor Thompson. Professor Thompson, he is going to start. Yeah, brilliant. S slide. Can you see those slides okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, brilliant. I'll just maximize them. So listen, I, I completely agree, and it's unusual, with, with every speaker so far, I absolutely endorse the message. What I want to talk about briefly, the science that we need to help us get towards these solutions, the solutions for the oceans we want. Now, I think it's important just to state the case that it's very clear now that plastics are everywhere, from large items so big you can see them from space, to nanoparticles that are so small, even our best analytical equipment can't detect them yet in the oceans, but we know they're there. It's very clear that there's evidence of harm and we could debate how many seals or how many sea lions or exactly how bad it is. But my point here is actually there's now consensus that there is harm. And so where does that take us? It takes us away from environmental science and social science about the harm. And it takes us towards what we need to address the solutions. There are some unknowns, and I could talk about these later. We don't know the full effects of nanoparticles. We don't know the full effects on human health. There'll always be unknowns, but the point I want to make is that I don't consider those are sufficient in any way to hold us back from moving towards solutions. We, we need to get on with it. 
where we have unknowns, in my view, is about how these solutions trade off between themselves. And I've got just four illustrations here. Do we clean up? Do we move towards recycling? Do we move towards bans? Do we try to phase plastics out of our supermarket? All of those things are relevant, but we have a very poor understanding of the trade-offs between them and the, old, and the unintended consequences that policy moves in any of those different directions might take. And, and there are more than four solutions. My point is, we don't have a good understanding of how the solutions might marry together and how they vary between different locations. Typically, with environmental science problems, we see at the top here this sequential scientists define the problem and only then do we start thinking about the solutions. With the current human population and the rate of plastics production and other environmental challenges, we need to start rethinking the way we address environmental challenges. So we start to think about solutions much earlier in the piece when we're first starting to see the warning signals. Otherwise, we're unprepared and we're wasting time in terms of the actions that are needed. So we need to move towards the bottom where we've got problem and solution running alongside each other much more than in, in sequence. Just to give an example of that, we, we know that fibres from textiles are a major source of plastics to the ocean. We know already textile design can influence that by up to 80%. But still, I see research investment in wastewater treatment capture, which is something not available to most of the human population. We see innovation going towards gadgets for washing machines. But I see very little in terms of research looking at how to design clothes better in the first place. So we need to understand these trade-offs so that we're putting our money and our effort where it can achieve the most effect. And typically it's at that design stage, but we're really lacking research at the design stage to prevent these problems occurring in the first place. So in summary, I would say that we need to recognize the evidence gaps are no longer in the oceans. They're no longer in the environments. They're much more about the solutions. We need to consider the science around the issues and the solutions in parallel. I sometimes see solutions that are proposed that actually don't really address the problem. There's evidence of trade-offs uh, between these solutions and we need, we need to gather that evidence to inform industry and policy. It's clear at the moment that, that we're losing, businesses are losing money because of a lack of guidance. We need to bring together scientific disciplines to help to bring this together because it's not just environmental science. But critically in that, particularly in the UK and particularly as a result of Brexit, we need to make sure we've got funding models that allow scientists to work together and not in silos. So thank you very much. That's, that's all I've got to say on the issue. But I think it's really important that we start to move the science from the environment toward the solutions that we badly need. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Richard. It, it, as always, bringing the data to the debate. Um, to coin a phrase, I think, uh, a Clinton phrase, um, to, to summarise your point, it, it's about the solutions, stupid. Um, you know, it, it, it is all about how we tackle this problem because the problem is monumental and it is, um, it, it is yeah. omnipresent. Um, and, you know, rather than putting our head in our hands and saying it's got beyond us, what we need is, is, is a set of solutions that are really going to take the, the, the scale of the task on. So um, thank you very, very much. I know um, uh, there'll be lots of uh, people from the youth panel who want to um, uh, ask questions. Um, um, thank you very much to all our contributors and I'm delighted to hand over to um, Hugo. Hugo. Thank you, um, Alison. Um, thank you, Steve, as well. And to, uh, a big thanks to all of our expert panelists. Um, it's great to have such strong cross-sectorial expertise with us today. And to Richard's point, um, uh, today I'd like to, to start by paying tribute to all of the volunteers around the country, the Service of Sewage and Keep Britain Tidy volunteers, the hundreds of thousands of people who have helped expose this issue and create the evidence for this discussion. Um, it's quite clear that we can't pick our way out of this problem. Um, and it's really encouraging to be discussing the systems and materials that we need and the science behind that to truly deliver a, a, an environment with less plastic pollution. 
And today we've seen a new 10 point plan from the government on the climate crisis framed by net zero targets and the Paris Climate Agreement. We now have the opportunity to drive the same levels of ambition and impact on plastic pollution through the Environment Bill and global agreements. Um, you know, the big question is how can government and business and communities and individuals go further to end plastic pollution and perhaps a circular economy and abundant renewable energy will be a big part of that. It gives me great pleasure um, to welcome our keynote youth listeners today, um, perhaps the most important voices in the room, the young people who will create change, not in the future, but right now with us by, by having these sorts of discussions. I'll welcome and introduce them in turn um, in a moment and direct their questions to specific panelists. And as you know, we're also expecting the Secretary of State for the Environment, George Eustace, to join us shortly. He'll up update us on the government's progress and commitments to tackle plastic pollution and then field a question from one of our youth keynote listeners, possibly a tougher question than question itself. But I'd like to start by um, welcoming Abby Tang from the British Youth Council to ask her question. Hi everybody, I'm Abby Tang. Um, I am from the British Youth Council. I'm also the Member of Youth Parliament for North Tyneside. I'd like to ask the expert panel, who do you think responsibility who do you think responsibility around plastic pollution lies with? Is it with government and councils to invest and clean it up? Or is it with the producers with how much packaging? Or is it consumers with their purchasing decisions and purchasing power? Thank you, Abby. And can I direct that to Lucy, please? Hi, Abby. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to say who it's not with, and it's not with consumers because they're trapped within the linear economy that I described before. And actually, once you're trapped in that system, even if you don't approve of it, as we know that many people have got issues with with um, uh, over package over packaged goods and too much plastic it's really hard to send a message back to the linear economy because the whole thing is set up if you buy something that's a massive thumbs up and that's really the only message that gets back and there are not enough other solutions so that means that I would distribute the responsibility um, among brands retailers but yes government and um, uh, policy makers and local authorities and recyclers to an extent, but I think the consumer often has a lot of responsibility put on them and they're not best placed to do much about it. But having said that very briefly, I don't like to think of people as consumers because we're global citizens. Thank you, Lucy. Um, um, and I'd like to welcome the Secretary of State, George Eustace, to the, the meeting. Um, we're really grateful for your time, um, George, on what is a really significant day for the government's commitment to the environment and building back better. Um, the big question, I think, is um, can we do that with less plastic? Um, and is it time for looking at and agreeing to plastic pollution reduction targets? Um, and I'd like to invite you to update our panellists and keynote listeners um, on the progress the government's making and the commitments that we'll be able to drive forward with the Environment Bill. Secretary of State. Well, um, thank you very much, Hugo. And, um, you know, I, I did catch the uh, start of the session and that first question. And I, I think um, my answer would be that we all have a role uh, to play in that government's definitely got a role in terms of setting uh, the right overall policy framework in terms of introducing bans on sale of unnecessary items of plastic, where we've already made some progress, uh, introducing levies to discourage the use, for instance, of single use uh, plastic bags and banning microbeads and so forth, but also introducing the framework for producer responsibility, because there is a role uh, for producers here. We do have a lot of unnecessary packaging uh, use and we do need uh, industry to think twice before using plastic packaging and to try to reduce uh, their use of plastic packaging and where they have to use it and there isn't an alternative, they have to take responsibility for making sure that that is uh, recycled. And then finally, I, um, I don't agree that there's no role for uh, consumers or for citizens. I think where you have a policy such as, for instance, a levy uh, on uh, plastic bags, um, 
you do have a position where sometimes people uh, will need to buy a plastic bag because they've forgotten their bag, but there, there is a role for them to make sure that as far as possible, um, they're not using those bags, that they have a, a bag for life and that they remember to take it to the shop. Um, there is a role for them as well in that it's difficult now with the current situation, but in normal times, carrying a, a reusable uh, plastic coffee cup with them that they um, uh, you know, ask a coffee shop to use rather than a, another one, there is definitely a role for, uh, for them as well. So we've all got a, a role to play and that's how it should be on big challenges uh, like this. And if I could just say a little bit about um, what we're doing uh, in this space, uh, you know, we were one of the first countries to introduce a ban on uh, microbeads, unnecessary use of plastic in cosmetics. Uh, we introduced the um, plastic bag carrier charge of five pence and we recently increased that to 10p uh, and extended it to all shops. Uh, that's been a great success in reducing the use of carrier bags and we want to go uh, further and we've, we've uh, introduced those next measures as well. Um, we've recently introduced a ban on the use of plastic straws because uh, business has managed to develop paper alternatives and on uh, plastic stirrers and plastic in cotton buds too. Uh, we are giving some thought to whether there are other areas where bans on single use plastic might be appropriate, uh, in particular on plastic cutlery and on plastic plates. And then we're uh, also uh, giving consideration now as to how we will use the powers in the environment bill that has resumed its progress through uh, the House of Commons uh, will be on the statute books next year. And one of the key um, powers within that is around extended producer responsibility, uh, getting businesses that use plastic packaging uh, to take responsibility uh, for it, for recycling it, for reusing it, uh, to introduce powerful incentives or disincentives uh, through financial levies to discourage the use of plastic packaging and to drive uh, industry uh, behaviour to change the way uh, that they uh, package their goods and package their, uh, their products. We do recognise there's always going to be a need for some uh, plastic packaging and there's a real dilemma in some of these areas that uh, if you were to remove plastic packaging altogether from, for instance, food, well, then you'd be uh, likely to see an increase in uh, food waste and a reduction in shelf life. And um, that obviously causes challenges and problems of its own. But what we want to get to is a position where we significantly reduce uh, our use of plastics uh, and then um, significantly increase uh, the amount of that that gets uh, recycled and stop plastics getting into our oceans altogether. That is our, <coughs> our aim, that is our, um, our objective. And I think we've got a, a policy framework now that enables us uh, to achieve that. That's probably enough from me, Hugo, as some um, opening remarks on some of what we're doing, uh, but I'm uh, happy to take any questions people might have. Thank you very much, um, George. And we do have our next, next uh, youth keynote listener um, who has a question for you. So I will come to Amy Rob from the Youth Climate Coalition. Hi, thank you, Hugo, um, and thank you, George, as well. And yes, I do have a question for you. Um, we've talked a lot already uh, about potential solutions to how to tackle plastic pollution, but I wondered um, how, what, like, what's going to be done about the big producers like Ineos, so industries who literally make plastic. Um, and are not only driving the plastic crisis, but they're also contributing to the climate crisis because they're emitting in the process. Um, so yeah, my question is what can be done and what will be done to reduce plastic production and turn off the tap at source? Uh, yes, I think it's a very good question. And often if you, um, if you remove the uh, demand for plastics because the users of plastic packaging, the food businesses that use it in their um, supply chain, often unnecessarily the manufacturers of um, you know, toys and other goods that um, put enormous amounts of plastic packaging around some of these things, even furniture manufacturers who seem to put polystyrene in vast quantities around everything. If you um, make them take responsibility for that and introduce powerful disincentives through the extended producer responsibility scheme, 
uh, to them using that uh, packaging, well then the demand uh, for it falls, and then the um, polyethylene manufacturers will, um, will will have to diversify into doing something else. I mean, we are alongside that, obviously working very hard to, you know, decarbonize our economy with some very um, stretching targets on industrial uh, emissions as well, which are set out under the Climate Change Act. Uh, and that uh, is also uh, going to drive some of those um, uh, behavior changes with uh, you know, measures to reduce carbon emissions from industry. So there's a, there's a, a sort of two pronged approach really. One is to, uh, to try to reduce the demand uh, for these. The other is to, uh, to, to, to actually get those companies that are manufacturing uh, to tackle their carbon emissions as well. Thank you very much, George, um, for, for that update. And um, I'd like to come to uh, our next um, uh, youth, um, our youth panelist, um, Nuralain Yunis from the Tahid al Islam Girls School, um, to ask um, a question. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Heather. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest things is telling the top of the salt. Um, if government was to introduce fiscal measures uh, such as a plastic tax or a plastic quota for commercial businesses. Um, do you, how do you think we could stay competitive with price products on the market and how do you think businesses will be stopped? Thank you. Thank you, Norley. I think that's a, it's a very um, important point and it's, I think it has been successful in some areas. So where we've introduced, for instance, a levy on, um, on carrier bags, uh, we've seen businesses um, uh, respond, um, well, we've seen consumers respond to that by um, dramatically reducing their use of um, carrier bags. Um, and I, I think, you know, we do have experience with businesses that if you, we've had it, for instance, in uh, reformulation of sugary soft drinks, that if you um, introduce a levy uh, on soft drinks that have a sugar content above a certain level, well, all of the food technicians and scientists in those businesses work really hard to find a way to reformulate uh, their product so that they can reduce sugar. And it's been a, a great success over the last two to three years is that you know, having a you know, not a tax on sugar, because the value of the sugar is still relatively low, uh, but a, ta and a tax on the products that have got a sugar content at a high level. That's had a sort of leveraged effect, if you like, on those businesses, and it's driven them to reformulate. So we've still got soft drinks like Lucasaid and uh, Coca-Cola and others on, uh, on the shelves, but they've all worked very hard to remove sugar uh, from those products. And the, 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 the soft drinks... Uh, I think we're trying to do something similar with the extended producer responsibility, which is, um, you know, to, to drive businesses really to think really carefully about alternative ways of packaging their products um, through some quite, um, you know, potent uh, signals in the by, by way of um, levies and charges and uh, fees that they'd have to pay to take responsibility for disposing and recycling of um, plastics that they use. So the, the intention in the way we structure it is to drive, first of all, a behavior change and to get those businesses, if you like, to reformulate uh, the way they use packaging. Uh, but accepting that that's not always possible, there's then also a responsibility for them to, to uh, take ownership uh, of, of recycling um, those materials at the end. Thank you very much, um, George. I'd like, now, I'd like to come to Matilda Hedge now from the Burton Borough Eco School um, Committee uh, with a question for Richard Thompson. Good morning, I'm Matilda Hedge. I'm part of the Eco Committee at the Borough School. My question for you today is, um, do you think that we should start capping the amount of plastic schools can use? So perhaps giving schools an allowance that they can use um, on products that don't have plastic packaging. So giving an allowance, I think that sounds like a great measure, Matilda, to drive, to help to drive change. I mean, in my view, where we really need change is, is at the design stage, you know, and I've been to recycling plants, some of our best recycling plants, and I see, 
you know, the sole the sole purpose in life for any one individual there is to intercept the bottles designed by somebody that's in this discussion. And, and that seems a tragedy when we've known for years that PET is a highly recyclable polymer. So I think I like your idea because I think it could nudge us in the right direction, but um, it frustrates me. And I guess I, I'd like to bring George in if we can here with the extended producer responsibility, because, you know, yes, we've seen the legislation on microbeads, but how do we get the industry to take that initiative? We can't ban everything. Um, the, the patent on using microbeads in cosmetics was filed 50 years ago. Did nobody in the industry ever ask the question, where are these all going? You know, if they'd done that, we wouldn't have had to chase around with the legislation. So, so Matilda, in summary, I like your idea because I think it'll nudge us in the right direction. But I feel that if we actually got our act together and designed better products, you could be receiving the benefits of plastic in your school without having to worry about taking that initiative. George, did you want to respond to that? Yes, I, I mean, I, I think Matilda's, um, you know, given, given a very practical, very local um, uh, suggestion, which is that effectively you people or schools or institutions would be given, if you like, a budget uh, of plastic that they could use and uh, they'd have to choose um, what they needed to use that on. And then if there was something that it was um, really essential for, well, then uh, they would choose to use it for that. And they'd have to work out other ways of doing, um, doing things uh, um, for, for other products. And I think um, that is broadly, although it achieves it in a different way, the extended producer responsibility is conceptually very much in that space, uh, in that it's um, it's basically trying to uh, through the the carrots and sticks that will that will exist within that, uh, really force people to uh, think about when and why they're using plastic uh, packaging. And the point about microbeads is a is a good one. When these things people just weren't thinking about the impacts on our oceans, they weren't thinking that these would go uh, end up effectively going through the sewage system with small beads that would end up in in the marine uh, environment uh, and I guess people at the time just thought oh well it's only a small amount well it does it accumulates because it doesn't go anywhere and that is uh, that is a really serious problem I mean there's there are other uh, big challenges though that we have to be aware of so um, things like um, fleece you know fleeces that are made and um, synthetic materials used in clothes uh, microfibers uh, of plastic do come uh, away from those when they go through a washing machine. Uh, that is another uh, a big challenge, uh, one that we need some kind of technological solution to at some point. But, you know, but as we move through the, um, the easy to see uh, plastics, the carrier bags, the plastic bottles, and we start to address, uh, address that, I think some of these other challenges yeah, you know, that remain a bit invisible at the moment, but are nevertheless real, uh, will start to be ones that we also need to uh, need to address. But I think I think Matilda's um, suggestion is a is a good one, and it's it's what we're trying to achieve really with with extended producer responsibility. Thank you. And can we come to our final uh, youth panel, um, Megan Abrahams, um, who is the Surface Against Sewage Youth Rep in Exeter. Hi everyone, thank you Hugo. Um, so my question is a bit of a two-part question. Um, so what is your favourite environmental technological advancement that has impacted plastic pollution within the last 10 years? And then where do you hope that new technological advancements will take us in the next 10 years? Uh, and George, if you don't mind, I'm going to put that to you. Um, I, I've... Um been fascinated to see um, you know the speed at which um, compostable plant-based um, materials have um, come into their own actually in quite a tight uh, in quite a relatively short time scale um, so you know I occasionally will uh, the House of Commons have these that you you think oh my god they're back to plastic forks but um, but you then realize they're not they're actually plant-based uh, alternatives that look a bit like plastic but they are compostable. And um, we've also seen um, some quite interesting uh, moves that the cooperative, uh, for instance, co-op shops uh, use compostable carrier bags. You know, they, they feel a bit more flimsy than the polythene ones, but they do, they do the job. 
Um, and it's very clear on them that you put them in your um, food waste or compostable um, uh, waste and they can, they can break down naturally. I think that's the most interesting thing that I've seen by way of a technological advance. Thank you very much, um, George. And I'd like to say a big thank you um, for joining us today before I hand over to Kevin Hollenrake, um, MP, the chair of the Tidy Britain APPG. I'd also like to say thank you to, to Alison and Steve for co-chairing this event with me and to um, the teams at Surface Against Sewage and uh, Keep Britain Tidy for all their help putting this together. And particularly to our, our, our youth keynote listeners who've come up with some fantastic questions today um, and really given us food for thought of how we move beyond the pickup of plastic and into the uh, the innovations we need to stop plastic getting into the environment in the first place so um thank you everyone and i'm going to hand over to kevin now kevin <clears throat> thanks hugo that's very kind of you and delighted to be involved in this fantastic session yes and i'm also delighted to be the chair of the all party group yeah, for britain for tidy britain um rupali have we got the results of the audience poll You were probably there. That might pop up as I'm speaking. Hi, hi, Kevin. I'm there. So overwhelmingly, we've got the answer to be government targets on plastic production. Great. So government intervention. That's very interesting. And uh, some other options there as well, of course, in, in terms of um, in terms of what we we can all do as well. And I, I think we've got the results on screen. There you go. See, government target seventy one percent. Um, deposit return schemes next most popular which is obviously coming in 2023 but I think it's fair to say there is no one silver bullet solution to this problem and it's great to hear so many wonderful ideas from our excellent panel real inspirational ideas and from our keynote listeners which I think came up with some fantastic questions so these are the leading thinkers in this space and it's great to hear the debate and hear the consensus actually and, the, about, and some solutions coming forward that can form part of how we tackle this in the future. And that dovetails nicely into the Environment Bill, of course, uh, which George referred to. Um, it's great to hear the passion from our young people in this audience and actually so many participants. I think we've have had nearly 140 people at one time on this call, which is great. Um, I think if I can pick one thing, one common thread from everything I have heard today is prevention is better than cure, whether it's the circular, circular economy, whether it's the butane of plastics, which I love that phrase. Um, I, I noticed that butane actually reinforced their 20 year old ban on plastic bags because it's not worked that effectively. So it is about implementation as well as as well as legislation and making sure that people are aware of the problem and what they can do about the problem. I think you, Ian, was talking about confidence in recycling and our recycling system. And George is right that we have these, these wonderful things in Parliament now with so recyclable cardboard boxes where we get our food in and cutlery, uh, compostable, but I often see those in the wrong bins. They're put mm -hmm. in the bins to be incinerated rather than recycling. So uh, again, it's, it's making sure people are aware of uh, uh, the provisions available to recycle this stuff rather than simply thinking that's going to happen as a matter of course. So, um, but I think, yes, I mean, Richard was saying prevention being better than cure. I couldn't agree more with that. And, and I think anything we can do to prevent this stuff getting into the system in the first place has got to be our focus. Extended producers' responsibility being the most exciting opportunity around that, I think. As soon as you give as George said, uh, producers are nudging in the right direction. They will find solutions to these problems themselves. So, um, and that's been the case with other things like plastic bags, of course, and straws and, co and cotton buds, whatever else it is. So, so we know that uh, businesses can find the solution to this. Um, the environment bill, bill will be the vehicle. Your ideas will be the context around that and the actual detailed solutions. So to conclude, thanks again to the panel and to the audience and to our partners, Friends of the Earth, WI, Tier Fund, Surface, Surface Against Sewage, and uh, keep, keep Britain Tidy. Um, we're all working towards that brighter, cleaner, greener future. Thank you very much.